How do computers remember? Whilst this question might not seem all that interesting, it's actually crucial to understanding most of the topics of computer science. And today, I'll explain precisely that. From the way that the tickle memory works up to a simple program to manipulate it, but first... So let's start this video off by talking about different types of storage. The topic isn't as difficult as it seems, because even though right here I'll divide the kinds of storage into four categories, they all effectively function in the same way, with some notable asterisks attached. They all just store binary numbers, which I've explained in the last video, and the medium how they store it, I've explained two videos ago. So if you have like a number, like let's just say 105, you can note it down in binary. And all of these would store this number in the same exact way. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is size and speed. Basically, the more to the right you go, the larger the size, the more you can store. The more to the left you go, however, the higher the speed, so the quicker you can modify the data. That's simple enough. Fast storage is expensive, meaning that if you want to create a massive database storing the entire internet, you'll probably need to compromise and won't be able to read it at a terabyte per second kind of speed. If you do want your reading speed to be fast though, then it will have to be more expensive. And that's why the tech wizards in charge of enchanting the magic rocks with the magnificent force of the pure <laughs> had to compromise. And that's where the division comes from. The cache is the hyperfast storage inside of a CPU that can just store a handful of numbers at best. Memory is still quite fast, but significantly slower than cache. The trade of being that is able to store images and videos much larger than just values. And then finally, storage which can store anything, but the reason why I separate it off into non-bulk and bulk is because with storage you can have it as a single device or you can have it as a theoretically infinite network of devices, blah blah blah, storage for another time. But the point is, saving a number in cache is the same as saving it in storage, because at the end of the day, it is just binary. And so that's what we'll go over in this video, that method of storage and the ways we can use it. But first, we need the data types. So, what are they? char, short, int, long, double, char. Those are the data types. What are they for? Well, if you remember from the previous video, all binary data is arbitrary depending on how you read it and has a maximum quantifiable amount of information it can store, which means that the only two things that would actually matter when it comes to data types are its size and the way we read them. And this is exactly what those data types specify. First, starting with size, char is 8 bits long, short is 16 bits long, int is 32 bits long, long is 64 bits long, double is also 64 bits long, and char is 8 bits long. That's their sizes. Just to visualize it a bit better, this is 8 bits, this is 16 bits, 32, and 64. Now what about the way we read them? Well, char, short, int, and long we read like binary integers, so basically like this. Next for double we follow this equation, which may seem complicated, but basically just means that the first bit tells us the sign, so whenever a number is positive or negative, then the next 11 tells us the exponent right here, and then these 52 tell us the number that we want to bring that exponent to. So basically that's just like scientific notation. And then finally the char. Char is different from how we read numbers because it's not there to represent any kind of, well, number. It's there to represent a character, so text. Basic idea is simple, there is this system called ASCII, which assigns a different character to each number between 0 and 255. Here you can see the table of all characters, and so if you'd like to represent a capital letter M, for example, then this is what it will look like. Simple as it could be. Except there is a fairly reasonable question you could ask. Make it. Why is M attached to this specific configuration? Or even further, why are any of these characters attached to those configurations? And to answer that, all you need to know is refer to rule 1. Everything is always arbitrary. So the reason why M is attached to this configuration is because why not? We built it this way. And there are more character representation systems out there if you're interested. For example, Unicode gives us standards for having more characters, so these standards can have many more sizes. But the thing I'd like to focus on is the fact that char appears twice on our list. And that's because both of these are the exact same thing. And that's where we get to data types in practice. I personally think that this will be the greatest part of the video, and that's because right here you will see how those data types work in practice, and how normal behavior, which would be normally quite confusing, is actually 
perfectly reasonable and logical. So let's start with a chart like this. Is it a number? Is it a character? Is it maybe both? Or maybe some kind of superposition of the two? Well, no. It's none of them, because this chart right here is just binary configuration and nothing else. The point being that we can read that binary configuration in different ways. And as such, if we read it as a number, we get this. If we read it as a character, we get this. But that's just the way we read it. That is really how it works, and just to prove that point, here's the simple program written in C to illustrate it. Now, I know that it might be a little bit of a lot, but all of this is just something called boilerplate, which we will talk about in future videos, and we don't care about it now. And we only need to focus on this, where right here we can see our variable called test, which is this specific binary configuration. And we create that variable of type char. Then right here, we print that variable, reading it as a number, then reading it as a character, then reading it as a number again, at this time, that number being unsigned. What is unsigned? Well, unsigned just tells the compiler that we want our variable to not have a sign. So a sign char goes from negative 128 to 127, whilst an unsigned goes from 0 to 255. Once again, the maximum amount of information can never change, so both numbers can represent 255 unique numbers. It's just that for the first one, they are shifted 128 numbers lower down. That was the point of the previous video, in case you haven't seen it. But the point of today's video will be different, and that will be the fact that if you have a 40 bits like this, then you can read it as a char, then another char, then a short, then a char. Or maybe you can read it as an int and a char, or maybe you can read it as a short, then a char, then another short. Or maybe you can read it as a char, but interpret them as ASCII text instead of numbers. And there we go, you get a word. And so that's how types work. They allow us to save different numbers with different formulas, but the underlying information never changes. And just to prove to you that this really is how it works, here's a program in C, which does the exact same thing as I just shown you in Blender. That is really how memory functions. And with that in mind, we can move on to... Memory and addresses. So, memory. Random access memory, to be exact, or RAM, if you're hip and cool with the youth, is the memory you use for accessing random things. So, for example, when you're running some kind of graphical 3D animation software, and you have a bunch of objects in your scene, then... Random access memory is where you store the location of these objects, their vertices, connections between them, faces, materials, and so on, so forth. All of this information needs to be stored. So, how could it be stored? Well, if we were to get mathematical, then each vertice is basically just a point, so it can be just fully described using x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate. So a three-dimensional vector, then the edges are a bit more confusing, but there's just a way to describe them with integers, so we can just describe it as an integer, and then the faces, which once again, integers. That's where we'll finish off. Which means that if we have three cubes, then each cube could be represented perfectly by eight 3D vectors, 12 integers, and six integers. Now these can all be represented using a binary number like this, which means that if we wanted to store all of these numbers on a single device, what we do is probably just take them, put them in a single line, and voila, all the bits get stored. Except if you wanted to recreate the original cube out of these bits, then how would you read them? Well, reading them isn't as difficult as it may seem. Like, yeah, sure, when they're all in a single block of ones and zeros, it may feel impossible and overwhelming to see it as a cube, but if I just add these visual aids to show what each segment represents, then and you can see that if you interpret each one as a number, it's actually kind of trivially easy. And so that's how data is stored in memory. You encode your data into numbers, you convert those numbers into bits, then you just put them all together next to each other, no fancy business required, and then you save a number into memory. Meaning that if you save a number into memory, all you effectively need in order to read it back is first, the place where we should start reading, second, the place where we should finish reading, and third, the way to read it. And wouldn't you know it, how long you should read for and how you should read it are both covered by the date type. Which means that in our cube example, we start reading here and read it as a floating point. The way that memory works is a bit of a story for another time, but the point is, if you were to open up your computer, take out your RAM, 
disassemble it and measure the voltages, then you could actually find this very specific binary configuration in there, this set of ones and zeros inside it. I'm going to repeat myself because I want this to be clear. Whilst what happens inside of our program is still a bit vague and hard to pin down, the way we store things in memory is literally like this. Real physical electricity arranged this way. With some minor asterisks we don't actually care about. So with that in mind, let's talk about this real memory. And let's ask a bit more real question of how would this look in practice? Well, first I should mention that when we're dealing with memory like that, we don't really talk about bits only, bytes. One byte is just eight bits. So basically we package our numbers into these eight bit long segments. Next in memory, you can think of numbers as just laying on a single line of bytes like so. In this case, I'm not visualizing it on a single line because there is enough space, but you get what I mean. Where each byte is a box with a value on the inside, that value being specific 8-bit long binary configuration and having its own unique address. So the first byte has address of 0, second 1, then a 2, then a 3, then a 4, and so on and so forth. These numbers tend to get pretty big pretty quick, and so an average address would look something more like this. And so with that in mind, I can paint you now a more descriptive picture of how variables work. Basically, here's the idea. First we start with a line of ones and zeros. This is our memory in which we'll store the data. Next, if we create a variable, let's call it test, then nothing happens. That's because all this tells us compiler is that we want to create some kind of test, but we haven't told it what it is yet. So let's do so now by defining it as a char. And there, this will be our char, a box that's one byte long. Now if we end the line like this, what this basically tells a compiler is that it should allocate a single byte in our memory like so. From now on, whenever we mention the test variable in our program, this box is what it will be referring to. So for example, if we just take the test variable and add 5 to it, then what that effectively translates to is us taking the variable from our box, reading it as an integer, and adding 5 to it, like so. Now one thing which you might have noticed though is that in our program the result we get is 6. Why? Well that's because when we create our variable, for example an int that's 4 bytes long, then our program creates this metaphorical box somewhere in our memory but it doesn't actually clear anything. That's why if I make this program that just creates a variable called int test5 and then just print the value of that int, then we get a random number. That's because when we create this box, it already has pre-existing random configuration of ones and zeros. And so as such, every single time I run the program, it just gets created in a different place in memory that's constantly changing, resulting in random numbers or it would be resulting in random numbers if it not for some funky compiler behavior which we'll tackle in future videos. That's why normally when we create a number, we set it to something on the very beginning like so in order to set the values and there we go. Now with that in mind, I think we've got enough context to perfectly understand our first C program. And here it is. So let's go through it step by step. First we start by creating a variable a. This variable is a long long, which means that we extend it to be 8 bytes long. Great. Now our program allocated some 8 bytes in memory for this, and there we go. Then the equal sign basically means set to, and we're setting it to a 10. So basically like this. Then for the next variable, variable b, we do the same thing. Long long is 8 bytes long, variable b, and we set it equal to a 5. Simple as it could be. And then finally the C, which once again we allocate and set to 0, simple as it could be. Now as we print those variables, we just read them all as integers, like so. Then what we do on the next line is we take the A, read it as an integer, take B, read it as an integer, multiply them together and set C as the result. And there we go. Now if we print them again, the C variable will no longer be a 0, and instead be a 50. And that's our program. And right here I would love to go more in depth, I would love to mention the difference between types, show this alternative version of the program and go on, but unfortunately I'm already two weeks late on this video, 
And so as such, I'll have to end it here. I'll leave the pointers and addresses for the next time, where we'll discuss even more complex programs with even more features. But for now, that will be it. I would like to thank my patrons for today's video, especially Acronymous, Useless, Quasar, Lakebird, and Positron for supporting the highest patron tier. Thank you so much. Without you all, I really wouldn't be able to do what I do. I would also like to thank All Matter, returning champion for these four pieces. They are all... I... I love them so, they're amazing. And for now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching and have a great day. Bye. So like, why was the black hole scene even in the video? Like, Make It didn't even mention the black hole. Why is it there?